Well, good morning. Welcome to church. Um, as you can see, we've got Sam up here this morning. We'll give Sam a welcome, if you would. Um, Sam's looking after us this morning. As you know, Steve Goodall's mom, June, went home to be with the Lord this week. And um, Steve obviously stopped at home with Liz and Lydia. And um, so we're going to pray for them right at the beginning. And I'll do Alan's mom's funeral tomorrow. Uh, but what we're going to do this morning, uh, we're just going to focus our attention on Jesus. Because it doesn't matter who else is in this building, the king's in the building. And I'm going to look into his face and I'm going to receive something of his grace this morning. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray. That's the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come. I believe we're in for a great morning, don't you? Is your faith level rising in your heart? Let's, let's just to God that he's going to meet with us today. I have a great word for you in a moment, but we're just going to worship Jesus, give him the honor that's due his name. But Father, at the beginning of this day, we want to just look to you, looking up to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We look to you, Lord Jesus, because it's all about you. It never was about us to start with. It's about your glory and your fame. It's nothing to do with me, but it's all to do with you this morning. So, Lord, we pray for Steve and for Liz and for Lydia, that, Father, in this time of their grief, that you'd be with them for Alan and Sorinda this morning as well as we contemplate tomorrow and saying goodbye to Alan's mom. God, would you just be with us in this place? Those who have got COVID, there's a lot many of our congregation touched by this at the moment. But, Lord, I just pray for us who are here in the house, I just pray that this place will be holy ground as we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name. Thanks, Sam. Bless the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Bless you guys. Let's worship. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy It's time to sing your song again. Whatever lies past and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Your holy name. I 
once again Oh trampled dead Where is your sting? The angels roar For Christ our King
singing a few words worship is a, a declaration of our hearts and a giving of all that we are so we're going to ask Sam to play that last verse again and I, I want you to make it a prayer as we come around God's word this morning if the whole realm of creation is mine if there's everything in this world is mine every pound every dollar every euro in every bank every castle on every hill every flock every herd every sheep everything all I'd still give it all to Jesus I give him everything because he demands more than that. He, he's worth more than everything that I could put together, anything that I could perceive or even give to him. He's so much more. He's given himself totally for me. How can I this morning surrender to him and say, All I am is yours, Lord Jesus? You may not normally do this, but if you want to stand with me, would you just raise your hands as we sing this song in surrender? If the whole realm of nature with my Lord, it's yours. And let's give ourselves up to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. The whole realm of nature, my that were in our far too small love so. Take your stage. Just take a still moment. Just, just prepare our hearts for God's word. Jesus says, "You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free." Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Let freedom flow in this place in this moment in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sam. God bless you. I knew not just because we were mourning with Steve and uh, Alan and other people, but I knew there'd just be a, a weightiness upon the meeting this morning. When you're in touch with the Lord, he tells you things in advance, you know. You don't have to wait. He tells you, you know, he does nothing until he reveals it to, first to his service the prophets. And I just knew there'd just be a sense of God's presence here this morning. And you know what we're going to do after a preach? We're going to pray for the sick. 
I've got my anointing oil out here. And we're going to break bread. But we just want to give the attention fully to Jesus this morning. We've called our series that I'm ministering to you called The Chosen. And my um, title for this morning is It's a Mother-in-Law's Tale. You know, I had a fantastic mother-in-law. Um, I told most of my mother-in-law jokes at her funeral. But I don't think you realise until you've lost someone how precious they are. And whether you're a mother or a mother-in-law here today, maybe you don't get the words that you deserve from those that love you, but we want you to know that you're a rock in our lives. I used to say I had a soft spot for her, a bog in the middle of Ireland. <laughs> but we won't go into that. But this is a mother-in-law's tale, and um, I'm reading three passages of Scripture. Uh, last week I explained to you that Matthew, Mark and Luke are what are called the synoptic gospels. They are um, gospels from, I, I just, I like to think of them as, if you're thinking about a television studio, they are the camera angles of what is going on and then John's gospel is the narrative behind what's going on. And um, so I want us to read all three accounts of the healing of um, Peter's mother-in-law from Matthew, Mark and from Luke. So here you go. In fact, I'm going to do something I don't normally do. Would you stand for the public reading of the Bible? Let's honour the word of God this morning by standing, would you, as I read the scriptures to you. We stand to worship, but this is his word this morning to us. Amen. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in the bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. She got up and began to wait on him. Then the next rendering, as soon as they left the synagogue... They went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. They immediately told Jesus about her. When he went to her, he took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. And then Dr. Luke's account. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. And they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Amen. Please take your seats. Father, we just want to thank you for your word today. We want to thank you for these precious accounts of what you did in those days when you walked the earth. And I just pray that as we open up the Bible together this morning, you will speak deep into our hearts, that healing will come, deliverance will come, and salvation will come to many as they watch us online as we're in the house. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So you are seeing three different accounts from three different disciples. They're all seeing the same thing, but they all have something to say a little bit different. You know, if you um, get an eyewitness account of a crash, the insurance company want as many different detailed eyewitness accounts as they can get because they, from that, make up the full picture. Because we don't always see or hear exactly what other people hear and see, do we? And so here's three different accounts. And the first thing I want you to notice with me this morning is as soon as they left the synagogue this miracle was not in church bless the lord it was in the house of peter's simon peter's mother-in-law god is not confined to the four walls of this building aren't you glad about that and we've been saying that all along haven't we that somehow we have crushed jesus and our church and our faith into a few hours on a sunday morning and maybe a little time in the week but god is wanting to work with us every minute of every day and whether it's a fisherman's cottage like here or whether it's in the supermarket, or wherever we might find ourselves, God is not conformed to a building. He doesn't have to wait into other on a building to get a miracle. When Jesus is with us, anything is possible. Amen? And so Jesus is now not in the synagogue. He's in Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house. It says, Now Simon Peter's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. Dr. Luke is the most descriptive of her condition. She wasn't just suffering from a bad cold. She was just suffering from a high fever. She was burning up. You know, a fever is not an illness by itself. You know, the doctor doesn't say, you've got a fever. Actually, you've got a fever due to an underlying condition, most likely an infection. And we've seen this with COVID, haven't we? We've seen people hot, flushing hot and cold, burning up because their body is fighting COVID. It's not that they have got, any, got suffering from a fever, they're suffering from an underlying condition. Most likely an infection. But whatever it was, it would have made this woman bedridden. 
And the scripture says, and they immediately told Jesus about her. I want you to understand the first port of call was Jesus. When there's something going bad wrong in our house, our first port of call should be Jesus. How often we run to other places and other ears and other voices, but these disciples suddenly began to understand the person they needed to get into this situation was Jesus. They did not call the doctor, they called Jesus. Isn't that amazing? They obviously believed that Jesus was not only able to heal this lady, but that he was willing. I think we need to both understand that our God this morning is able to heal you, but more so he is willing as well. He said that to the leper, didn't he? The, the one who um, came with leprosy, he said, if you are able, he said, I'm more than able, I am willing. The book of Hebrews, which we studied in great depth during lockdown, if you remember, I did a whole series on faith. Now faith is, Hebrews 11 says this, without faith, it's impossible to please God, but everyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those that earnestly seek him. We need to put Jesus first place. In the, in the in issues of our lives and the issues of our homes, who's the first person that we turn to? It needs to be Jesus. Our job is to seek Jesus first. So let me show you the different camera angles again from the scriptures so we build up the picture. Matthew's gospel, he touched her hand and the fever left her. Okay, so touches her hand, fever leaves her. Mark's gospel, so he went to her, took her hand and helped her up and the fever left her. Okay. And then Luke's gospel, he bent over her, rebuked the fever and it left her. As I said, these are not contradictions. These are through camera angles of the same incident. There are three different elements to this healing. So let me put them all together for you, okay? So I've, I've made one scripture out of three. Don't stone me for being a heretic. But this is how it should read. If all three of these accounts are put together, this is how it would be rendered. So he bent over her. He rebuked the fever. He touched her hand. He took her by the hand. He helped her up and the fever left her. That's what happened, didn't it? We've seen it from three different angles, but that's exactly what happened there. So there are three key elements here this morning, and this is what we're going to do. When we, if you come forward for prayer or you stand where you are for prayer for, for sickness, this is exactly what we're going to do. There are three key elements here. He spoke the word. He rebuked that fever. He told it to go in the name of his father, and off it went. He touched her, and then he created an act of faith. I want you to notice here this morning, Jesus didn't pray a religious type prayer over Peter's mother-in-law. And we get, when we come to praying for people, we don't half get religious, don't we? Why is it we think that if we multiply words and beg God with some kind of strange sentences that somehow healing would come? Oh Lord, if thou canst, you can heal Peter's mother-in-law here, Joan. She's very hot and she needeth a touch from you. Thou knowest she's been a good servant and she make us the best bread pudding in the synagogue. Would you look at thy humble servant and bless her and heal her? How many prayers a word like that and nothing's happened at all? Jesus didn't pray that kind of prayer. In fact, he didn't pray at all. The scripture said he rebuked the fever. Jesus told that fever, go. You know why? Because he had the authority to do so and he told his disciples, I'm giving you the authority to go into all the world and preach the gospel and lay hands on the sick and they shall recover he didn't tell us to go and pray for the sick he told us to heal the sick now we're sweating because most of us have never entered into that kind of realm before he rebuked the fever jesus also touched a hand things happen when we touch people it's called impartation whether you like it or not it's a scriptural principle that things are imparted through touch and we are called to lay hands on the sick and it was Jesus' mandate to us personally. And I just want to ask you, when was the last time that you personally, not the church, not the pastor, but you put your hand on somebody and said, in the name of Jesus, be well. That's why I don't think we're seeing the river of healing that we should be seeing in the body of Christ is because most people leave it to the minister or to a healing service or to some time in the church here. And yet, I tell you what, God wants to break through in your workplace, doesn't he? He wants to break through in your boxing ring. 
He wants to break through wherever you find yourself. Because as we reach out in proxy in the name of Jesus, we're carrying the authority that he's given us. And he's told us to minister to people just like that, hasn't he? So ask yourself the question, when was the last time I ever laid hands on a sick person and commanded it to be well in the name of Jesus? You know, Jesus often talks about us having the authority to bind and to loose. And, you know, sometimes we just need to take the authority that has been given to us. We said the other week, didn't we? You know, sometimes we're waiting for God and actually God is waiting for us. He's waiting on the other side of our obedience. We're waiting for somebody to become well and healed. And yet Jesus has told us to play our part in their healing by laying our hands on them and seeing them recover. In Matthew 16 and 19, it says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed on heaven. And the final element we see here is that Jesus helps her up. Jesus got us to do something that she was incapable of doing before. She was lying there with a fever. She was out of it. She was delirious. But as the healing touch came, he lifted her up off that bed and healing flowed. Now, sometimes, you know, in a, in a, if you're in a prayer line and you're believing God for something, just, you know, if, if you've got some stiffness in the joint, start moving that joint and believing that God is going to give you the ability to do what wasn't there before. We need sometimes to take a step of faith. But then the scripture goes on to say, so Peter's mother-in-law gets a double dose of the Holy Ghost, doesn't she? And she gets healed, which is fantastic. And the scripture says she gets up straightway and she ministers to them. Then the Bible goes on to say, when evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with a word and he healed all the sick. This was the fulfillment was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. This miracle was the catalyst. This woman's testimony caused others to come for ministry. And when you look at the life and work of Jesus Christ, you cannot divorce divine healing or the power gifts that he flowed in from the message that he brought. It's simultaneous. He's teaching things, and then he's then demonstrating the kingdom of God. He declared God's kingdom, he declared God's goodness, and then he demonstrates it in the fact that he's driving out darkness and sickness and disease and the demonic. And so very often I think we, just, we, we, are, we are quite happy with the teaching side about the kingdom of God, but then God is asking us to get involved with stuff that he's going to push back darkness. We need to be a church that is pushing back on the darkness that's in this community. And again, you see the power of the words. Notice the gospel record says he healed all the sick. Nowhere do we read in the gospels when Jesus said, come back tomorrow, I've run out of anointing. Have you ever read that? And Jesus gathered the crowds and he prayed for a few and he said to the others, better come back tomorrow, I'm a bit tired. I'm a bit worn out. Never, 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 never. Or he never said, it's not my father's will for you. You can go home. No, he healed all the sick. Now, when I read, not just a casual reading, but an in-depth reading of all of these gospels, and I read the book of Acts, it is quite evident that divine healing was part of the ministry of Jesus and therefore part of the ministry of the disciples, therefore part of the ministry of the early church. And now we live in a generation that is powerless and we've put all the emphasis on the healing evangelist, Mr. Big with his jet and his white suit. You can keep Mr. Big in his jet and his white suit because the Lord has given us all the ability and the authority to go heal the sick. And now you're sitting there going, not me, surely. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. These Galilean fishermen, you, you will see in some weeks to come, he sends them out. And they don't come back disappointed because it didn't work for them. They came back rejoicing that even the demons were subject to them because there was something about taking Jesus' word and taking some steps of faith that saw the miraculous born in their community. So I want to challenge you this morning as a church is, is that we need to minister to those that are in need. I'm not dismissing prayer. Prayer is very, very important. But I want you to see very clearly the ministry of Jesus and how these things work. Because Jesus prayed, he heard the Father, then he ministered to the sick. 
He didn't call a prayer line and pray for the sick. He'd already heard the heart of his father for the sick. He'd already got the words of knowledge and wisdom for those that were coming. And he healed them all. That's why the disciples, I told you earlier, that's why the disciples so, so teach us how to pray. Because they saw the value of prayer. Because they saw that prayer and communion with the Father was the very thing that drew the miracles that were happening later in the day. And that's why as a church, I'm so glad we are reading through the scriptures this year. As you read through the scriptures, say, Jesus, help me to have faith, to make steps of faith like the disciples did, like you did. Help me to minister people. Help me to take up the Great Commission rather than being sitting here and getting it all right in my own mind and all the little tick boxes and my doctrines and this. And I know that. And no. You know, when you stand before Jesus, he won't ask you how much you did. How much you know. He's going to ask you how much you did. He's not going to say, were you really highly educated through the word? He's going to say, what did you do with my word? Because the word of God is, the Bible says it's active, it's alive, it's like a double-edged sword. We're supposed to do something with it, not just let it stay in our minds. So we can be chuffed that we know a little bit about God. Now God has given us his word, that we might be able to work with the word, and work with him and co-labor with Christ to see the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And we need to raise our level of faith and start to trust and to believe God for so much more than we've ever done before. So Peter's mother-in-law gets a touch. It's one of those minor characters in the scriptures. You think, why, why did God write that in there for us? Because he wants you to know that he cares about your family today. He cares about the sick people in your family today. And he wants you to take some steps of faith towards them. It's difficult, I know. It's harder ministering to your own family than he's ministering to people that you don't know. Because sometimes with your own family, you feel a little bit embarrassed. What happens if God doesn't show up? Amen. I ain't going to be. Amen. What happens if God does show up? I'll tell you something. But, oh, you, you, you don't want to raise people's expectations. No, we do. We, we do want to raise people's expectations because their expectation is not in us, but in the God who we've been singing about, the one who died on Calvary. He came not only to preach the good news, he came to demonstrate the good news, to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to cast out demons, to raise the dead and to proclaim the kingdom of God in all of its fullness. And therefore, we're supposed to be just like him, going out into all the world and making disciples. <laughs>